The city, gentlemen, has now been steadied on an even keel, saved by the gods from shipwreck in the violent storm. And I have summoned you, especially, because I know you always paid due homage to the rule of Laius, and then to Oedipus when he was king. Then after he had died, you stood firm by his sons with sound advice. So, now they have fallen on a single day, polluted, striking and struck down at their own hands. It falls to me to take up sovereign power through my close kinship with the dead. There is no way, say I, to know a man, his spirit, mind, and judgment, all the man, until he's shown his worth in handling law and governance. For in my view, the one who runs the country, yet does not hold firmly to best policy, or keeps his mouth shut from some fear. I've always held a man like that beneath contempt. And I've no room for one who values his own kin above his fatherland. All scenes use now be my witness. I would never hold my tongue if I could see disaster looming for my fellow citizens to threaten their security. Nor would I ever count my country's enemy as kin to me. <laughs> I recognize it's this that keeps us safe. And it is only when we sail upon an even keel that we can work out who our dear ones are. It is through principles like these I aim to make this city strong. Accordingly, I have proclaimed this edict to the citizens concerning the two sons of Oedipus. Eteocles, who perished fighting with distinction for our country, shall be buried in the tomb with all the rituals that should accompany the noblest dead below. As for his sibling, namely Polynices, who returned from exile in the hope of burning down his native land and family gods, desiring to taste kindred blood and drag the rest away to slavery, it has been publicly decreed that nobody shall give him funeral rites, nor mourn for him. His corpse must lie unburied for the birds and dogs to rend, a spectacle of shame. Such is my way of thinking. On my watch, wrongdoers never shall be rated higher than the just. The man who stays true to this city shall, in death and life alike, have honour due from me. We have just heard the speech of Creon on Sophocles' play Hidden. And we're going to have some more readings from that play in a few moments. But let me say a few words by way of introduction. That I am Rabindra Singh, chair of the Lawyers Group of Classics for All. It's my pleasure to chair this evening's event and to welcome you all, including those who are watching online. Thank you for coming to this event uh, on Greek tragedy in the modern world. I'd like to thank everyone uh, at Classics for All and others who helped in organizing this evening's event, and in particular, Theo Traian, a partner at Allen and Overy, for kindly sponsoring our event this evening. Can I introduce our various actors and speakers? Paul Omani, who you've just heard from, is an actor and director. His acting credits include the Royal Shakespeare Company, Orange Tree Theatre, and English Touring Opera, as well as worldwide touring with his own company, 
out of chaos. He has staged every single Greek tragedy online with Harvard's Center for Hellenic Studies. He's currently writing a full-length musical based on the ancient Olympics, as well as developing a large-scale community and professional production of the Aeneid, incorporating modern tales of sea crossings. We're going to have readings later, also from Ebby Miller, who is an associate director of Actors from the London Stage. Her credits include leading roles at the National Theatre, Shakespeare's Globe, and the Royal Shakespeare Company. She recently finished playing Roxanne in Jamie Lloyd's production of Serrano de Bergerac. And on uh, the stage with me, uh, the discussion after our readings is Fiona McIntosh, who is Professor of Classical Reception at the University of Oxford. She is a fellow of St. Hilda's College and is director of the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama. She's currently involved in the Gilgamesh project, which is an all-night epic event, which is being held overnight this coming weekend with Alice Oswald, Professor of Poetry at Oxford and 40 other artists. So without further ado, can we please go back to you? And you. Now, answer me and keep it short. Were you aware that doing this had been forbidden by the proclamation? I was aware. How could I not be? It was clear enough. And still you dared to contravene these laws? I did. Because for me, it was not Zeus who made this proclamation nor did justice, who inhabits with the gods below, decree these laws for humans to observe. I have concluded that your edicts, since you're mortal, are not strong enough to override the statutes of the gods, which are unwritten and unshakable. These do not date, you see, just from today or yesterday, but live forever. And nobody knows when they first came to light. So I was not prepared to pay the penalty before the gods for breaking those, not out of fear for any mere man's way of thinking. I knew I had to die for it. Of course I did. That did not need your proclamation. And if I die before my time, I count that as pure gain. The one who lives amidst as much distress as me can't help but see death as gain. And so for me, this doom of yours is far from pain. But had I left the body of my mother's son unburied there, that would have really hurt. Well, this does not. And if you think I am a fool for what I've done, the one who passes judgment on me is the fool. Well, let me tell you, attitudes that are too rigid are most likely to come crushing down. An iron that has been forged to extra hardness, you will see most cracked and splintered. I have known the most unruly horses broken with a little bridle, and rightly so, because big thoughts are not allowed in one who is a household slave. She showed her expertise with insolence. Back then, when she defied official laws. And after that, here is a double insolence. She laughs and revels over what she's done. Now I'm no man, and she's the man. His control of hers is going to stay unpunished. I do not care if she's my sister's child or closer kin than everyone who shares our whole household Zeus. She and her sister, too, will not evade the nastiest of deaths. Yeah, I sentence her as well, as being equally involved in scheming for this burial. Go summon her out here. I saw her in the house just now, just 
distracted and hysterical. The mind that's plotting wrong in secret often gets detected in advance. And yet I hate it too when someone, after being caught, attempts to paint the crime as beautiful. So is there anything you want beyond just killing me? No, nothing. Having that my everything. Why are you waiting then? I have no liking for a single syllable you say, and trust I never shall, just as I am bound to keep on being disagreeable to you. And yet, what higher glory could I win than by performing my blood brother's burial? And all these people here would give me their approval were their tongues not clamped by fear. One of the great advantages of one man rule is liberty to say and do just as you please. But you alone of all the Thebans sees things in this light. These do as well, but gag their mouths in front of you. And are you, are you not ashamed to think so differently? No shame in honouring those born of one womb. Did his opponent to the death not share your blood as well? He did. Same father and same mother too. So how can you bestow a favour that besmirches him? The man who's dead will not support that view. Not even if you honour him as equal to that filth. It was his brother, not some slave who died. Out to destroy this land. The other stood in its defence. Yes, Hades still desires these funeral rites. The good should not get equal treatment with the bad. Who's to say what's rightful in the world below? An enemy can never be a friend, not even after death. I'm bound by birth to join in love not join in enmity. Then go below and love those there if love you must. No woman's going to be in charge as long as I'm alive. My tomb my bridal chamber, and my deep dug dwelling, my forever cell. I go to you to join with my own people, with so many of them down among the dead admitted by Persephone. And last of all of them, go I. My ending far the worst, before I've reached my proper share of life. At least as I reach there, I'm sustained by hoping I'll arrive as loving to my father, as beloved for you, my mother, and as loving towards you, dear brother, since all of you, when you lay dead, I washed and dressed and poured out funeral offerings with my own hands. And Polynices, now it is caring for your body, I'm, re I'm receiving this reward. And yet my act of honouring you was in the eyes of thinking people, good. Because if children I was mother to, or a husband lay there dead and rotting, I would not, take, I would not have taken on this labour in defiance of the city's will. What is the principle I observe in saying this? Suppose I had a husband who was dead. There could still be another. I could still produce a child born of another man if I had lost this one. But with my mother and my father dead and down below, there is no way another brother could ever be born. It's in accordance with this principle I paid you this especial honour. But Creon thinks I did reckless wrong, my dearest brother. So now he's taken me by force and leads me off, me with no wedding bed, no wedding song, without my share of marriage or of raising children. But no, like this, bereft of friends, I make my way alive into a dugout cavern of the dead. What justice of the gods have I transgressed? But why continue looking to the gods? What allies can I invoke in prayer since I am singled out as wrong for doing what was right? Well, if this wins approval from the gods, 
then through my suffering, I'll come to recognize my error. But if it's the ones here who are in error, may their pain turn out no less than that unjustly visited on me. Um, we're going to have a uh, discussion now, and I will include Paul and Amy uh, in a moment as well. Um, but I promise that there will be plenty of time uh, after that discussion amongst the panel members for uh, questions from the audience, including the online audience. If they can please put questions into the Q&A box, uh, and those will be relayed to us here. Uh, but Bill, can I ask you please to start by explaining what the audience has just been? Um, what I think you've watched, like, it's very interesting uh, for me, is first of all, you watched a ruler, a new ruler who is determined that the ship of state is going to go steady after a crisis. Um, as, as you heard, the, the city had been invaded, and finally it looks like peace, and the new ruler emerges. And I think for the most part, if you listen to the words, the principles seem sound. Nothing was going to go between the welfare of the state and um, definitely no family concerns were going to rock um, that determination. The way Paul played the scene, and I'm sure some of you would have you know, noted, um, I think we already began to feel that this was maybe rather an insecure new reader, sorry, new leader, and um, maybe the principles that we heard might be quite hard to live up to. And I think by the time we get to the second scene when Evie um, as Antigone and the niece of this new ruler was challenging her uncle and pointing out that the, her, the uncle's decree, which was to refuse to bury her brother who had taken up arms against the state because he had, in many people's views, a legitimate claim to um, to the leadership. The way Creon reacts is quite extraordinary. And I think most commentators on the play today would say that even the first audiences in Athens in the fifth century BC might have felt at this time that what we're seeing is an insecure leader overreacting. Of course, our 21st century is are particularly concerned about the misogyny um, that, 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 that becomes increasingly obvious during the course of that speech. And most shocking, I think, of all, is the moment when it's not just the person, Antigone, who buried against Creon's ruling, her brother. It actually now includes the sister for scheming or for doing something that clearly is also undermining the uncle, the ruler of state. Mm -hmm. And I think we haven't seen the scene, the next scene, which is the scene with Creon's son, also the lover of Antigone. And um, even though Socrates plays that love interest to a minimum, that is the moment when the son in effect tells us Father, you need to hear what everyone outside is saying. And, and of course, Antigone has already um, indicated that this new insecure ruler is really presiding over an autocracy. He only hears what he wants to hear, and he's not sound, taking any soundings out in, in, in the wider city. So, as Everyone knows, and Jean Henri, in his famous version in, 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 in the Second World War, said, you know, it is wound up the plot and it can only 
go in a particular way. And in the last scene, Antigone, having break, broken the edict, is now on her way. Thank you, Evie, that was beautifully read. That is a very difficult um, scene, as I'm sure many of you know, to perform in the theatre, especially with those kind of controversial, disputed lines, which basically said, I wouldn't do this for a husband. <laughs> I can get another one. Um, but because I don't have a father or a mother, I can't have another brother, and that's why I've done it for my brother. Those lines aside, um, in a performance, um, this is a very slow scene. It's in the Greek, it's sung, and then spoken in the spoken, the spoken meter. Um, and it's also incredibly moving. I mean, Seamus Heaney's version, some of you will know, is particularly brilliantly um, uh, moving because it draws on, um, you know, 18th century Irish lament. And in some ways, and I thought you brought out the emotion beautifully, this is a, a long lament that is played out, I think, in about 10 minutes or so in playing time when you play the full mm -hmm. So you go off to your rocky vault, and um, I don't think it would be a spoiler if I, <laughs> if I say that you there take your life. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course, we now realize that in some ways you are from the scene, the middle scene that we saw, absolutely the person we're rooting for, whether we want you to be rebel, as of course many Antigones are, or whether we just want to see you as someone with a, a legitimate claim that's not being heard. Um, we have seen, especially with your um, interpretation, for it seems to me, a, a Creon who doesn't just live up to his principles, but actually is absolutely, I mean, not just proto tyrant you are tyrannical in the scene we witnessed. Um, and then in the final part of the play, and I, I think sort of most people today acknowledge that, that some performances that make you absolutely rebel, who we kind of end up revering, or uh, in some ways um, with our 21st century um, eyes, we actually have the second part of the play when Creon, in a very Shakespearean way, it always seems to me, absolutely recognises, was forced to recognise first with Tiresias's help, that he has not just failed to live up to the principles, but that, of course, there is no way that polis and family, despite, sorry, city and family, despite um, uh, the theory, <laughs> very much um, in um, the fifth century, that they are coterminous, and that if you try absolutely to ignore one, you will end up, as Creon does, by privileging the city, losing, he loses his son, and he also loses his wife. And that final scene seems to me to be, increasingly, I think, in modern productions, I think we see the tragic dimension there. So, Paul, you may have led us to believe that we hate you throughout, but I think by the end of the play, we feel quite differently. <laughs> uh, we started this evening with Antigone because this is uh, an event organised by lawyers, classics, although I'm aware that uh, many uh, non lawyers also uh, here and watching online. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about Greek tragedy more generally. In, in, in a moment, but uh, uh, just to finish with Antigone, if I may, some, some of you will know that four years ago, I gave a talk to lawyers of classics called Antigone's Law, and uh, I suggested in that talk that that famous scene, which we heard yeah. Eddie performing uh, about the uh, edict of Creon not having been laid down by the gods, not by Zeus, as far as I'm aware, that's the first time in Western thought that we hear of the idea of a higher law which uh, deserves our obedience, uh, whatever the decree of the state, sometimes the positive, may say. 
Uh, and uh, since I gave that talk, um, I, I looked at a, a very famous talk by Sir Hirsch Leiter, uh, which he wrote at the end of the Second World War called An International Bill of the Rights of Man. And that, that provided the inspiration for what became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights two years later. Um, but what I hadn't previously been aware of was that Sir Hirsch Leiter uh, expressly referenced Antigone. So I think that we could we can see that very direct connection over two and a half thousand years of uh, certainly Western thought of that concept of a higher law, uh, whatever the decree of a state like Nazi Germany may have said. Um, but I feel like, uh, and, and Paul, can you please join us here if, if you want to take part in the discussion? <laughs> What are the challenges of putting on a Greek tragedy today? I mean, one, one thing that modern audiences will not be familiar with. Um, is the chorus, which plays a very important role in Greek tragedy. Um, some of you will have seen the, the production of Madeira, which is currently planning London at the Soho Theatre. And I thought very interestingly, what the director has done there is to have people seated amongst the audience who then do the part of the chorus. But, how, how do you cope with these challenges? Well, it's a very good question. Um, and um, I, think, I think one of the challenges perhaps is connected to is, is that there is perhaps not the familiarity with some of the forms that come along with tragedy in the same way that we might perhaps are more familiar with classical theatre, Shakespearean theatre, kind of that's just something that is on and on. Um, and therefore, um, you're very often kind of working with audiences who are not so familiar with this is the, the way that these plays sometimes kind of get put together. Um, I think a really important aspect then of that is that there's no way that you can recreate a fifth century Athenian audience, and nor should you try to. Right? Um, and that actually then it's <coughs> I think it's incumbent upon you when you are putting on a play and retelling these stories that you can be, feel free to be as imaginative um, as you like in terms of how you kind of recreate some of these ideas and some of these forms as well. So I think imaginative use of chorus, I think that um, I'm also a firm believer in, in really judicious cutting. <laughs> <laughs> not least because, and I think, and not that you want to lose beautiful poetic passages of chorus, say, for example. However, you need to accept that the audience two and a half thousand years ago was going to get something from that, that no one or very few people, a, a vanishingly small number of people <laughs> might get um, in, in a modern audience. And it's not, if I, we always kind of, I think as an actor or as a director, think, it's like you can't play a footnote. And if you're going to do something, simply so someone near the back can go. go <laughs> Um, then you're going to alienate the rest of your audience because you've got to bring them along kind of with you as well. So I think that's a really important factor when you're looking at um, stating um, uh, to today that actually, you know, several years ago, I worked on a sort of a, a kind of a, a version of the Oresteia mm -hmm. um, that was actually sort of speaking of several stories, actually including Iphigenia and Aulis and, um, and some other uh, plays as well. And one of the decisions that we made was just creating sort of that there was an internal framework of references that we could stick to. There were certain myths that we would kind of stick to, which occurred across these plays anyway, but that we would keep coming back to those so that we could build an understanding within our audience of what we're talking about, rather than just suddenly throwing in, you know, sort of four more very obscure references <laughs> halfway through that would lead people. To that's, that's I mean, from your point of view, as an actor, you've been in different plays, modern and mm. ancient. But is there any difference? How, how do you approach it? I think you you try to approach them in the same way. 
I had a director once who said you should treat new plays like classics and classics like new plays with the same reverence and irreverence, um, the same kind of opportunity to question without the burden of feeling like you should know something because it's been around for 2000 years. So, you know, um, the, the whole room is able to investigate together and at the same time. But I think in terms of chorus, I think there's something really amazing in Greek theatre about having the presence of the, the group, the group mind. And we play a lot as actors with the public and the private. And um, when we're allowed to be our true selves and who's that in front of? Is that when you're alone? Or do you, are you actually more yourself when you're in front of people or with people? And having the pressure or the support of a group who are thinking and moving independently um, I suppose maybe that's a distinction as well and maybe more modern productions you'll have distinct voices within the chorus in a way that I don't know, maybe, yeah but I think it's um quite fun and that I've not seen the Medea actually I need to book but that sounds great in the audience in a month well, Greek tragedy it could be said has a very formalized structure mm -hmm. now, I can't, you know you will know um who, who was the playwright who introduced a third actor well, they say it was Sophocles. Right. Yeah. And um, some people um, uh, also say that was in part because Sophocles had a small voice and he was no longer able to be the first actor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the story goes, of course, that um, Thespis stepped out of the chorus and then became the first actor who interacted with the chorus. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by what you know, Paul and, and the Evie are saying, and, and also Evie, your excitement about a chorus being around. And, and obviously, as a director, Paul, sometimes you'll despair. Well, that was me to speak. <laughs> and, so on, and, and so I thought Soho Place production did solve that problem very well. But mm -hmm. I thought not just by putting, as some of you may know, and, and as Rabina said, you know, um, individual members in the audience, but I thought ingeniously made up for the lack of collective movement mm -hmm. by having Ben Daniels, who was, to me, absolutely stunning, as he plays Jason um, Aegeus Creon, and um, he then moves to me like a chorus and definitely a chorus as we see them on group classes so as in a kind of freeze and uh and in kind of slow motion i mean it's pretty compelling i thought so i felt that that combination of the voice and we heard everything that the chorus said because of the individual voices um but we didn't entirely miss what i think is thrilling mm -hmm. which is this collective movement, and as everyone says, and, and when I work with, with students, especially those who are not trained initially as classes and discover classics later, is they're excited that that's what's special about, mm. about Greek tragedy and what's going on here and what can that bring. And, and obviously we have musical theatre traditions to, to kind of work with, and I think actors today have some kind of movement training that they didn't have 20 years ago. Um, and so I think we're slowly moving away from the idea that the chorus is a problem to thinking about what, especially in terms of emotional amplitude. I mean, I think the chorus just, and if they move and sing, just adds so much. And um, occasionally we've got resources, you can see that. Paul, um, trying to, to generalize the discussion even more, I know I said in the introduction that you have done uh, online versions of every single extant tragedy that we have. What, why is it that two and a half thousand years on, we're still interested in these tragedies? Well, yeah, I, and I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit the context that how I met up doing that. It was um, just over three years ago as we went into our first lockdown and all of my work got cancelled um, and in a moment of despair. I, I, I contacted the Centre for Learning Studies and suggested at that moment that it would be really wonderful to just meet up online, bring some acts together, read some scenes, create a sense of kind of community, offer, an, offer a chance for people to perform who love performing and who have the chance to do that at that time. 
and also then to explore what these plays may or may not say about the world that we're living in and the experiences that we're having at the time. So I, I, I suggested that in an email. <laughs> and then got an email back quite quickly. And then we, we had a meeting on Monday where we sort of discussed, is this a good idea? I resume, of course. And then um, and then so I remember leaving that meeting on Monday saying, we said, okay, we're gonna try it, let's just see how it goes. And well, I left that meeting saying, okay, I'm gonna go and call up some actors. <laughs> I knew they weren't working. <laughs> um, and, and Emily was one of the actors I called up. Yeah. Um, and so so we that was on the Monday, and on the Tuesday we did our first reading. Which was um, Euripides, mm -hmm. Helen. It was the only one that we didn't live stream. It was called Next And we did it, and it was a really lovely opportunity for us to, to do some of those things, like to start kind of talking about what we were all going through and share some things together. And we have that. <clears throat> the element of the shared experience was hugely important. So we decided after that we would do it again the following week and the following week and the following week. And we ended up doing 40 consecutive weeks of live stream different Greek play. Um, and we ended up working with <coughs> 120 actors around the world, and 50 academics were involved. We ended up doing a 24-hour odyssey that took place across six continents <laughs> um, <laughs> and in various languages. Um, all of it from our front rooms and our board and whatever else. So I sort of like a two-year-old and a two-month-old kind of, you know, making occasionally making um, inappropriate appearances. <laughs> um, uh, and, so, and so what was it that kind of kept us going back to it was that every single week it felt like we had chosen that plan to exactly match what was going on during 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 sort of you know, that very strange <laughs> time. So we ended up having kind of really extraordinary kind of conversations that were um, Inspired by, so, you know, so very early on we did for the TTs, and obviously that's a play that deals a lot with isolation, loneliness, how do you reintegrate into kind of starting to sort of actually be in the same space as other people. Um, again, um, Oedipus touches on sort of different things around leadership, which is very kind of significant, <laughs> uh, but also the leadership in a time of, of great illness and pandemics kind of come to themes, you know, there's sort of all the things going on. Um, and then, um, as well, sort of, uh, we we were reading Ajax um, shortly after um, sort of the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement kind of starting, and then incredible conversation kind of emerging from performers involved in that, talking about their experiences and how those related to say the question of um, the Tuca in uh, in Ajax and you know why is he less of a person. Than agents. Why is his why is his his sort of, um, status lower because of sort of the number of his birth? It, it just it's every single week mm -hmm. these these conversations would start inspired by the scenes that we had been reading together. And of course, we we ended up programming it sort of after about five weeks of trying to so let's try and do it. But mm -hmm. all of it was planned and kind of way 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 in advance, and yet it was always so exactly. Corresponding to what was what was happening, that was kind of really good. Really um, is there a danger of being anachronistic? Uh, it, it, in what ways are the plays not of our time? Okay, so in, in that scene we heard earlier, for example, when Antigone talks about Zeus and the gods and so on, uh, that wouldn't necessarily resonate with a modern audience. Um, well. I think sometimes actors um, and, and, and I think readers and members of the audience find it very helpful that it is about a society that is not immediately familiar to them. Um, and, you know, I already mentioned Henri Antigone, mm -hmm. um, distance, of course, at times of crisis and definitely times of censorship is really um, uh, extremely helpful. But I also think um, there is a sense in which perhaps tragedy, Greek tragedy, and your series, I think, will absolutely demonstrate it, has become a kind of wiki common. People, even maybe people who don't know, you know, the whole plot, maybe have heard of Oedipus, and maybe have even heard of um, Antigone. 
And so they are able to engage both in a kind of culture text, if you like, a text that's somewhere out there, like people say, you know, um, who amongst us knows a Christmas carol? <laughs> but we do know a Christmas carol, but probably never read it. Um, and um, I, and I think that then enables us, when we watch it unfolding in front of our eyes, to not only engage in the big ideas as we do in Antigone, but also very often the difficult ideas, and especially as a number of people pointed out, the metaphysical ideas. I mean, there are, you know, we're talking about gods that, I mean, I believe there are a few eccentrics um, in Greece who still celebrate Dionysus, for example, but I think for the most part, we're talking about gods that no one believes in today. So you can have serious conversations um, about very difficult topics. And, you know, again, my experience, and I'm sure yours, taking um, plays into, um, well, I've never done it, but I've got colleagues who, who, who read these plays in prison context. I think you've done that, both of you. Um, and so you can have conversations um, about seriously difficult questions relating to sexual violence and um, abuse of all kinds by looking at um, Medea, for example. And, and so I think distance, and you're absolutely right to remind us of that, um, helps. But I don't think, um, you know, I've got some colleagues who get very upset about the number of adaptations um, that we find all the time and say this is not Greek tragedy. But just like culture text, they're out there and they're everybody. You know, they may be some of us who occasionally like them, but we own them, you know, that we probably feel that now about Antigone. But actually, they are precisely texts that we can think with, that we can maybe weep with at the good moments, um, but absolutely work out in, you know, multiple contexts. And I know that's true of Shakespeare, right? That's what a classic is, isn't it? I mean, um, classic is forever a rolling stone, and, and it's what it gathers that matters. Thank you. I would like to open it up for questions from the audience. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think there is a facility for those who are watching online to be able to post questions, and they'll be uh, relayed to us here. Um, but if anyone has a question, Please do. Yes. Uh, just noticed recently there's been a bit of controversy in the papers about some modern stories being uh, adapted, changed once the authors die, made a little bit more um, acceptable for today's audience. Can you ever imagine these being um, toned down <laughs> to be made more acceptable? I think that's really interesting. I've, I've done lots of Shakespeare and I've been in Room, rehearsal rooms where really different decisions have been made. Um, I think there are some plays where the problems are so deeply entrenched. That, that's what the play is about. You can't take the sexism out of taming the truth, for example. But um, in lots of cases, we have removed lines that actually don't. It's maybe a similar discussion to um, the Greek chorus, what that would have been for an original audience and what it is now lines that would have meant something or nothing perhaps to an original audience don't sound the same now um, and in some ways I feel like in honoring the original intention of a text sometimes you find that actually the thing to do is edit it yeah there's something nice about Greek tragedy I feel like makes you feel like things could really be worse <laughs> we are <laughs> <laughs> Um, during a particularly, I mean, hor horrifying period of time during the lockdowns. But then we read Trojan Women. And we thought, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, I'm just thinking um, about how you can <clears throat> edit or rewrite to such an extent that it ceases to be anything uh, like um, the source text. And, um, I don't know if anyone in the Almeida's Greek season three or four years ago um, saw a Medea that almost it seemed to me had done that. It was, mm -hmm. um, as I think people noted, the chorus 
for all yummy, yummy mummies or whatever. Um, you know, off to their new bath. And um, I mean, it was kind of clever because um, Lydia was a was a writer, but it it, it was actually so kind of twenty first century, particularly North London. As <laughs> kind of local concern, in my view, it, it was kind of embarrassing, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely. I mean, that was a travesty, and but I'm I was very tolerant, <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, because there is there, you know, I, I feel like a few changes here and there, but if you're going to do the play, <laughs> or don't, if you you know, okay. I, I can see a hand up there. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering what your general thoughts were on the, you said mentioned doing it in several languages across the globe, um, also doing it in the original Greek, and I know that has that is done sometimes, and whether that brings something, yeah, just thoughts generally on that versus doing it in yes, modern language. Yeah, can you mention that you've done some production in different languages? Do you want to start with that one? Yes, yeah, so we've done, um, as part of our online series, we've done a couple of um, bilingual episodes in um, Spanish and English. Um, in English and modern Greek rather than English Greek. And I've, I've performed in ancient Greek uh, before as well. Brilliant. Well, that's very kind. I keep getting up there this year. There's some. Um, uh, and I think that um, so what so what comes up in in those I think that um, you know one of the things that we've sort of touched on a little bit is something to do with um, you know, the rhythm that exists within the different scenes, um, the musicality of different scenes, how that kind of um, alters as well. And I think that 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 kind of can still communicate in a very powerful way um, when you're when you're um, forming in playing the original. Like the, in the in the play that I did in 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 with Medea in ancient Greek, we had an awful lot of music as part of that, and that was kind of really integral. And of course, that was part of the original kind of performance practice as well. And it's something that is really kind of joyful and amazing, and really you know can just you know the same way that we might go to opera mm. and it's being sung in Italian or German or wherever it might be. Then um, and it can still kind of move people. Then I think that you know, that's music and the lyric power of certain passages of yes yes yeah, so, so the antithesis to the almeida's yummy mummies which i did see was peter hall's production of the Aristia, which i'm sure many of us here saw and i remember the profound impact it had on me was partly derived from the masks and it seems to me the mask is kind of a mediator of those intense emotions. And I, I, I sadly don't know your work, but I wonder, have you experimented with the use of masks in your productions? Well, actually, um, so um, in, our, in our online series, we haven't used any masks. Um, and actually, it's something with one of the big challenges when all of us, we also worked um, in real life productions as well, not just online. <laughs> but just to say that about the online, one of the challenges with that is that if you're just you are so far removed from the original version of what. But if it's a lot, so last summer, I was out in Edward Alros working with a group of students and performing kind of, you know, in the great orchestra there. And it's very, very different then to being in front of a computer with a camera. <laughs> and, so, and so it performs a different function. And what was interesting to me then through the series, actually, is discovering that that, that it all still holds up. And that actually, you can have a different relationship with the audience directly through a camera. Um, like that than, the, than how you would with masks. I've certainly seen lots of productions with masks that are incredibly powerful mm -hmm. um, and, and brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I think that there are, um, uh, I talk with Amy Cohen, mm -hmm. is, um, who, who does lots of productions with masks um, in the US uh, recently, and kind of got to experiment with, with some, well, not experiment, but to see close up rather um, the, the masks. That, she creates and yeah, they are incredible. And you you have some in the, in the archive. Yeah, we have. Actually, um we we don't have the Peter Hall mask um, from uh, uh, the design by Jocelyn Herb, I'm sure you know. But we because they're in, in, in the National Archive, but in our archive we have some masks made for an Oxford Greek play 
with the help of Jocelyn Herbert's assistant, who basically made the mask, um, and um, and they are such beautiful, beautiful objects. But of course, they are bespoke, all of them, for individual actors. Mm -hmm. But the, as you know, and everyone who saw the Peter Hall or Asai know, the idea that this is a fixed face, it, it, it is animated at every turn with, with different lighting and, and so on. And, and, and I, there's a, someone we know, Mary Louise Cawley, for example, who, who trained with Ariane Mushkin and the uh, Arthur du Soleil in Paris for 10 years, and she is a dancer. And she is a masked dancer as well. And it is some of the most beautiful, harrowing things I've ever seen. So I completely agree with you that masks can transform bodies in mm -hmm. amazing. Have you, have you done performances using masks? I've never done any performances with masks, but we did a lot of mask work mm -hmm. during my training. And I loved it so much. Oh my goodness. I think it's. I mean, it feels like magic. It's a, it's it feels like a kind of fascinating magic of the human mind. That you can look at something that you know to be, I don't. It hasn't changed. It hasn't moved. You know that, but it feels and looks like it has the power of physicality and um, people in space and bodies and how the same mask on different people do. I, I yeah, I I love I love it. <laughs> it's good. It's amazing. Yes, a hand up. A different question, just given the sort of context of, of this evening's talk in Classics for All, could you just comment on how far the difficulties of making some of Greek tragedy, both because of its form and its content, accessible to school students? Uh, it's, it's a drama student. Definitely, you know, very often work with Greek tragedy. And from what I understand, and, and before I worked in Oxford, where I worked for a number of years, I, I worked at Goldsmith, where mm -hmm. in the English department, but some of my best students were theatre students and music students who came to my course. And um, I, I, I know you're talking about a younger kind of age group, but um, there are translations that um, are accessible. I think the one we read from today, which is Oliver Chapman's translation, is one. They're incredibly clear. You don't, I think, um, need to uh, take the beginning of a tragedy and go through to the end and insist on sort of reconstructing every minutiae. But I think there are scenes, and definitely um, uh, in my experience, um, Worked a lot on Medea, you can have brilliant conversations about the famous women of current speech with uh, GCSE students um, and get them to perform bits of it. So I, I, I think the way maybe some of us over the years have taught tragedy is not very helpful. Um, I think there are lots of people and definitely there's quite a lot of good resources that um, We've learned on together, for example, um, uh, that are available through our, our archive as well. So I hope that's changing. And if you've got ideas of the kinds of things we can do, please let us know. I work with the RSC education department quite a lot. And um, I feel like there's lots of helpful things. And I have never, I, I hopefully will never cease to be amazed at how engaging, that, and I've worked with, tiny children <laughs> on Shakespeare and you worry that maybe it's too adult or too scary or they won't understand what's but they just love it they love the drama they love it feels so human and so exciting the fact that movement and song is an intrinsic part of Greek drama as well just feels like a complete gift in terms of introducing that to young people who might not be excited by sitting and reading a script, but to get up and perform and to sing and to move is joyous. Yeah. But we're almost out of time, at least for the formal QA session. Uh, we have a question online. Yeah. Um, would you agree that one of the qualities of Greek tragedy, which makes it particularly relevant for us today, is its moral complexity? I find the most satisfying modern productions are those that retain the multifaceted interpretation rather than focusing on a single moral issue depicting a character as in the right or in the wrong? Yes. 
this evening, uh, I'd like to introduce Stephen Cook, who is a teacher at Bean County Primary School, uh, which is a large primary school in Barking and Dagenham, one of the most socially deprived boroughs in London. Uh, over 70% of pupils there do not speak English as their first language. Um, since 2021, Classics for All has supported the teaching of Latin at that school. Uh, and Latin is now taught in the main language for all pupils from year three onwards. And they love it. So that, that is a, a, a small sample of our extraordinary story. I'm Hilary Hobson, I'm the Chief Executive School. And believe it or not, our mission is to get to the state school because there's a big disparity between classics of its status in the independent sector and state school. Um, and over the last 13 years, we have been championing classics in the state sector. We worked in over a thousand schools. We put classics at GCSE level into a lot of what used to be derisively described as bog standard comprehensives, mm -hmm. and we're very proud of it. And there's evidence that the, uh, the teaching of classical civilization at A level is beginning to increase. And surprisingly enough, there's a huge appetite for what we do in the primary sector. And we do this by training teachers who are often not experts. In primary schools, they're generalists. We train them to teach classics from scratch. And we do that sustainably by working with them over time. And Kathleen Cook here, the partner in Dagenham, was is one of our latest guinea pigs. Right. Has, uh, <laughs> and has come to give to swear to give us testimony about how well it's going to be. <laughs> We've heard a bit from Rabinda about the context, and the context is quite is there anything we'd like to add about that? Because that's an extraordinary context. It doesn't strike me that Latin embarking in Dagenham. <laughs> is necessarily the first thing that people think. No, we, we are a large school of over 600 children, um, and we have 75% speak English as their uh, second language, 25% think free school meals, um, and the borough itself, 48% of the children are living in poverty. The North of Oxford. So what would you say then to somebody who said, uh, well, why not teach them English? Why bother with Latin? I mean, because you get a lot of people saying that, wouldn't you? We've got all these languages oh, anyway. They're really the huge confusion. We discussed it as a senior leadership team a few years ago. We launched it in September 2019. And we wanted to equip our children with a wider vocabulary. We wanted them to develop their etymology, the understanding of the words. And we also at the time had quite um, a large proportion of uh, Romani Gypsy children. Um, and the Romanian language is very similar to Latin. Um, I had one of the boys when I introduced it in year two, who loved telling me that I was mispronouncing. Yeah. <laughs> he loved it. And his English was, was poor. And I heard him speak in assembly, he's now year five, last week, just by chance I was in there. And the quality of his vocabulary and the confidence that he speaks with. And, and Latin has played a part in that. So, so when you first took this proposition to your head teach, did you mm -hmm. said, you know, came up with this bizarre idea? How did it, how did it, by the way, she's in the audience, so. <laughs> <laughs> are you there? Yes. <laughs> you got to be careful about what you say. It, it was, it was Tracy's idea in the beginning. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I think I must have mentioned at some point that I had studied that in, <laughs> up into O level, in, in secondary school, and all of a sudden I became, the leader of 
Um, and I've actually got to thank Tracy for that bit, and my daughter's with me as well. She, they will both tell you I've got a little bit Latin crazy, <laughs> and I've, I've have found a new passion for the subject, which has filled into school. So, are you using the, there's a lovely course called Minimus, where it's about a little mouse on Hadrian's Wall, um, and you know, quite a lot of Latin. You get up with a dotive case, don't you, in it? Yeah. yeah, it's not, you know, it's, it's a good course. Did you, so you've got your, your bit of Latin in the past. I mean, how's it gone down with the kids, though? I mean, the children absolutely love it. Um, Anna from Classics came in um, beginning of the year to do learning walks with me, interview the children. Um, one boy, year five, said he really enjoys it. And when he's rich and famous, he'll be able to speak to people in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spoke to the year sixes. Year sixes have sometimes got a bit of an attitude before they go to secondary. <laughs> They all wanted to carry on at secondary level, um, and they want more of it. Um, so, so are know. there any chances for them as a feed of primary when they go into secondary? Are they likely to be in a school where there are opportunities to study classes? In Barking Dagon at the moment, there is not. But my one of my initiatives for next year is to invite our feeder secondaries into Beam to see what we do, mm -hmm. observe a lesson, speak to the children because they, they all love it. And we have had success in the past at the kind of filtering up as primary schools put pressure on secondary schools, some of them start to introduce classical civilization or Greek, Greek or Latin, so that it can work. And, and what about the future? Is, I mean, are there going to be confident teaching this? Are you going to carry on? We're definitely going to carry on. The yeah. staff are taking it on board. Um, it, it gives the children some aspiration. In Barking and Dagenham, there's, there's not always a lot. And so many of our children aspire to become lawyers, they become doctors, and the language will help them. Yeah. I've recently started a Latin drama club. So our production will be at the end of term with Minimus. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, hope to start inviting parents in to do a course with them as well, so they can to sort of equip them to help their children. So here, Catherine is like a shining example. And of what we aspire to do. And, and, and it's a demonstration of the relevance of this and the relevance of this breadth of the classical world for children of all abilities. It's not just there. Classics is not elite mm -hmm. unless you exclude people from studying it. So that is the thought. Um, we, we are around, we're a small charity. We really rely on your support coming to these events, joining our lawyers group, and if you can, making a donation to what we do. Um, because we, we raise every single penny to work with schools and it's cost effective and it's changing the situation. Um, when you go down to the reception, there are some teachers amongst, put your hands up teachers and pupils. <laughs> <laughs> they will wait there you and tell you how great the work is looking um, and, and please talk to them because I think they're living testimony of the value of what we do. I'm going to hand back to Rabinda because it is now half past five past six. And this is anything else, Hilary, that you want. I think now it's time for uh, drinks and cafe. Uh, Thanks to Rivenda and the team.